Oh, I'm Henry George Preston, born on the 12th of January, 1926, at Rose Bay, number three, Spencer Street, Rose Bay. <laughs> I went to uh, Rose Bay Public School. From there, I went to Cleveland Street Intermediate High School. But whilst at Cleveland Street High School, second year, I had a ruptured appendix and blood poisoning had set in and I had to be operated on on a Sunday night straight away and I was in hospital for just on six months. I lost all that schooling. When I did go back to school, I asked the teachers on uh, detention if they could help me along while they were watching the detention. They said no. And they said, doctor said, but you can't carry a school case for 12 months. So they said, well, can you get somebody to carry your school bag to work? that school and I did find out but that wrecked my schooling career completely. I pulled out of school at the end of that year in 19... 1940, yes, in 1940 and I then got my first job working for a company making radar, uh, English radar, which was better than the German radar. I worked there for a couple of years, up to about 1940, 42, early 42. And, but whilst I was there, the government decided that they were going to change the aircraft corporation instead of making it all at Bankstown, they were going to put different sections in different garages. So they transferred me to a garage at Rose Bay where I lived. There I made exhaust valves for the Bayford bombers. And it was there at the end of 43 that I got my papers from the military to gather medical and that, so, which I did when I decided that I could join the army then. So early January 44, I uh, started negotiating with the call-up system. I was called up into Waverley Oval at, at Sydney for a medical and everything. And then I was allowed night leave to go home and back and forwards. My last occasion was Oh, I won't uh, say goodbye again to be back tonight. I never went back and never ever saw her again. And uh, I had to go back to the showground. <coughs> and uh, my accommodation there was the old cattle stall who they used to put the cattle. <laughs> and from there, we moved out to uh, to the 14th Battalion at Cowra. But what amazed me was that many people at Central Railway Station waiting to wave us goodbye. It was supposed to be an all secret. <laughs> and uh, I left on the 8 o'clock train to Cowra arriving there about six o'clock in the morning. Now you can do it in one day. 
From there I went to the second recruit battalion and from there I went into the 14th Infantry Battalion. And there was whilst there that the Japanese were planning an outbreak. The, the government didn't know all about it, but they were, weren't really interested. Now in the Kara camp, I had Italians, Japanese, Indonesians, civilians, all in different compounds. And the Japanese that leaked out that they were going to break, he got his throat cut. And it was at two o'clock on a Sunday morning of the 5th that they break. Now, previous to this, we had been out every night waiting for a red berry light to go up to, to say they had broke. I didn't see that, but it was a really cold night too, morning. <laughs> On the Sunday, well, the Sunday afternoon on the Monday, but the, uh, the Lieutenant Doncaster, he took a little search party with him out towards west going towards the young and the Japanese come out from behind a rock, waved the flag to surrender. So he said to his group, you stay here, I'll go and check him. But when he went to check him, they uh, just jumped out and hacked him to death. Now, we weren't allowed to carry a loaded rifle under the Geneva Convention. The Japanese had said to the quartermaster, we want some more blankets. It's cold. Oh, yes, yes, he made all the blankets. Oh, we want some more um, picks and shovels. Oh, we're going to start a garden. Oh, yes, that's good. Now, what, what happened there was that the blankets were to be used to throw over the barbed wire and all the gardening instruments made of the weapons. See, uh, the whole affair, the camp commandant at the time was, I can't think of his name, he got the blame because he wanted more weapons and everything. He got blamed for the outbreak. He got the sack, discharged from the army. <laughs> I went on a search party and on the extreme end. And I said to the chaps on the inside of me, keep an eye on me, I'll go down along the riverbank, which I did. Been being down there for a while, I thought it's getting dark. I'll go up and see what's going on. But when I get up to the bank, they're all gone. And I had seen marks on the river bank, whether they were cattle, kangaroos or human, I wouldn't know. So I had to work my bearings out and I saw a uh, farmer's house. Fair way away, I see a light shining. So after a bit of a walking, Matt, I approached the house and knocked on the door. The lights went out. I had to identify myself, where I came from. And the, they let me in and when they questioned me where I'd, where I'd come from, I said, well, that big clump of trees near the river bank. And they said, well, that's where we reported the Japanese. <laughs> So I could have walked right through them. And uh, when I said, I'll have to ring up uh, Army Headquarters, and because all the telephones were all hooked together and everything, and you had to go through a, 
through the switch at Cowra, and as soon as I started ringing and listening, he click, 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 everybody else all listened in until I got through to, to the Cowra camp and they sent a truck out to me. But it was a very bad direction for the driver too, because pitch black. To find a, a track that went up to the house for him was hard. The only letter boxes were old oh, five gallon drums of petrol drums or kerosene drums, <laughs> the hole poked in the front. <laughs> and luckily, he followed the right track to the house of where I was. Now, when I got back to the camp, and reported into the ordinary room. They weren't going to even look for me until the next morning. <laughs> and that was it. And whilst I, during that week, my mother had passed away and the following Sunday, I was at the theatre watching a picture show. My name kept coming up on the screen. I, I wasn't even reading it, I just, Nothing to do with me. Then they stopped the show. Then they yelled it out and, well, that's me. They didn't offer me transport back to the unit. I had to run back. And then all my gear was packed up, ready for the 8 o'clock train out of Cowra. And whilst at the station, I was approached by the um, Provo Marshal and told me I was not to talk to the media. Upon arriving at Central Station, the same thing occurred. The pre Provost greeted me, you don't tell nobody. <laughs> I couldn't even tell my father, because he kept saying, it's all in the newspapers, what's happening up there? <laughs> Now from Cowra, I went to the 1333rd Battalion, which was a young soldiers battalion. Now that, that brigade of, of young soldiers consisted of three battalions, all under the age of 19. They were the 1333rd Battalion, the 41st 2nd Battalion, and the 18th Battalion. I was then uh, posted to a uh, part of the 1333rd Battalion attached to the Armoured Brigade or Battalion, 2nd 5th Armoured Regiment at Caloundra. I was camped at Battery Hill. Now the idea of that, they had big tanks there, they called Battery Hill, and they were the uh, General Grant tanks. And being a section leader there too, actually, I said to my OC, why are they changing the tanks? They're putting bigger ones in. They were the Sherman tanks. And I found out that General MacArthur was planning a land invasion of Japan. So him and Blamey had a bit of a row about it. And Blamey said, we are not going on a land invasion of Japan. They have massive gas and they're going to use it. I'm not going to lose men. So they wiped that. I went away in the sister ship for that, called the Duntroon, and it was converted into a uh, landing ship. It had all these armaments on it and you name it. <laughs> and uh, went up to uh, Weewak, but before arriving at Weewak, we were at sea. Every night we did um, boat drill but while the, that was six o'clock, but while the boat drill was on, they used to turn the radio on. 
and you used to listen to uh, Tokyo Rose and a chap called Cousins. And they used to say how good the Japanese were going and, and talk about our boat, we know where you are. <laughs> Uh, fair at wee whack, I got crushed between two trucks that put it on me back. And no hospital, no nothing there at all actually. I just put in care of, a, of an orderly for a couple of weeks and I, oh, I got good, no worries. But after the war I started to get the back pains and everything. and. I never applied for a pension then. I just that'll do. But when DVA found out when they come to Taunton up there and read the record, they said, You see the pension office straight away. And they gave me a hundred percent pension. <laughs> yes, while whilst I was at I was transferred to the four battalion <coughs> and whilst whilst that um in four battalion, I applied for a welfare job with the army. But my first mission was to take the PIB battalion from Muiwak to to Lay, offload them, and put the ones that that lay under the boat to get to rebel. Everything worked all right. And whilst I was in Lay, I had a call up to go to Finchhaven. There was a bit of a skirmish up there with Japanese and natives. We soon fixed that up. And then I had to come back to Lay. But I come back in an army workboat with some officers going home for uh, discharge. Majors and the captains, lieutenants, about, about four or five of them. They sat in the back of the boat drinking all their drinks and everything. I sat up with the coxswain on the boat at the front and never even offered me a cold drink. And they always said to me, he said, Where did you come from, young'un? I said, From the Wee Whack campaign, sir. That's it. <laughs> So while I was down at Lay again, I then went across to Rebel on the American troop ship, the Winchester Victory. And when I, was, when I went to Lay, I was doing a bit of welfare with the Chinese and the um, and the native population and everything on Indians. That was quite good. But when they transferred me to the looking after the uh, Australian troops, that was terrible. The way they treated me. When I was at the hospital unit, they said to me, Oh, we've got, we've got a football team here. We want you to make the coffee and tea and drink after we finished training. And that stirred me up a bit. So I thought oh, I'll light the fire one of these days for them and see what they say. Well, I did light the fire. But somebody had put rain straw on the timber. <laughs> Burnt all my arm and you know, I was in the hospital myself. I applied for a transfer out of there and went down to the 112th Works Company, which were the, the laborers to the engineers and all that building roads and that. And it was from there that I uh, got the message that I'd be returning home. <laughs> I was quite pleased to be coming home, but at the same time, my father had remarried and I actually had no one down there to go back to. <laughs> Eventually, I, 
my wife, which I knew before the war and everything, we married in, in 47. Yeah, 47. And uh, she passed away in 2009, um, which is only, I think it's next Sunday, is the Bonnie Cooper, my wife's name, come from Watson's Bay. And um, the, where I first lived, well, we lived separate for a while because we couldn't find accommodation. And then I transferred out to Owen Bay in Sydney. There was a big American hospital there, which they converted into little housing units. And we had half a hut. And uh, it was quite good. Actually, it was... Um, Four hundred odd units there. One to two hundred were the good ones. Three hundred and four hundred were the bad ones. <laughs> so uh, we stopped there till I got a house allocated to us. From from there we went up to Maryland's and just out of Parramatta. And I lived there until 1987 before I came up here. My daughter and son-in-law had the shop up at Taunton. They were the first grocery business in the, in the district. I worked at uh, Goodman Fielders. They had the big wheat silos at Rhodes and sitting on the Parramatta River. And I worked there as a, I did a painting course by the way before this, the sign writing and that. I worked there as a painter doing up their trucks and outside maintenance. Trucks just had big red squares on them. And, uh, And they sold, or they, they bought Allied Feeds. Allied Feeds I worked for originally, and Goodman Fields bought them out. And whilst at working for them, I was told to cut some lagging off the steam pipes, because no one knew what the danger was. After I left, and retired in 1992, they discovered I had asbestosis. Now, there was no, no, no treatment for it. And all they said to me, the doctors, don't ever change what you're doing. Walk, walk and puff yourself out all, which I did. I do have uh, x-rays every 12 months done by the Dust Board of New South Wales. Now, Goodman Field has paid me a small sum to stop me talking so nobody else will put claims in. It's all wrong. So at the present stage, I've got the pleural plaguing on the left lung but nothing's going down the airway. <laughs> Yet my sister-in-law, she worked at Parramatta Hospital in the x-ray department and they were pulling down the old fibro wards at the back of the hospital. <laughs> I mean, we had to meet her one day at Circular Quay and she said to, said to me, she said, oh, I can't breathe, I'm running out of breath. 
a nudge, sort of low. I said, you mentioned to your doctor? She said, no. So she went and saw the doctor, and the doctor said, well, you've got six months to live. She had it, and it was six months. Mm. Another, another experience I had prior to the army was the Japanese, the uh, attack on Sydney Harbour. The mother submarine of the Japanese was off Bondi. You know, I lived in Rose Bay and I could see it right across there. And they were firing shells at the Rose Bay Air Base, the flying boat base. They were lobbing short and going too far, but you can hear them whistling over. Our forces, well, head blokes and that, never took any action against far and back. Now, another night, before the uh, submarines come in, a plane from the Japanese submarine flew down Sydney Harbour. I was also attached to the air raid wardens, so I saw it all. And it went down Sydney Harbour while we were building Garden Island dock and never turned the lights off there. I even turned the lights on the mascot for him to land. <laughs> that was a week before the attack on Sydney Harbour. They followed the ferry through there to get in. One got caught in the nets, and the other one, the other two got in. And their main target was the American uh, ship Chicago. They fired the torpedoes and they went underneath and struck the ferry called the Cutterville, which was a, um, a dormitory for the sailors over there. The torpedo went through the, through the ferry and landed on the grass on Garden Island. The, the, they, they got one submarine in Sydney Harbour. One was tangled up in the net. The other one I didn't find for years, but I did find it off Broken Bay, off the Hawkesbury. Not so long ago, actually. So it's a war grave now. Nobody's allowed to go near it. I'm very proud of my family, actually. <laughs> and um, with Anzac Day, I think of me mates, the mates I haven't seen or I know of have passed away. It always reflects in my mind. And I, I do get questions when I'm in the Jeep sometimes. My father was in the army. Did you know him? <laughs> Try not to worry about it, you know, and keep your mind clear and on your objective, what you want to be and what you're going to do. Mix with the the outside, make friends, but don't go into a, into a, a single lifestyle. Just mix with all your mates all the time. <laughs>